since anything that's relevant to LTI resistive circuits is uh, also relevant and uh, of importance uh, to phasor domain circuits, we can, not surprisingly, talk about Thevenin and Norton equivalents for a one port in phasor domain. Okay, and the situation is just like in the LTI resistive case. Okay, so just like in the LTI resistive case. Okay, that is, if you have some one port. <coughs> yeah, two terminal device. So this is this is a one port in phasor domain. Then this from the input output point of view or from the uh, current voltage characteristics at the port terminals point of view can be represented equally well with this simple topology, okay, where we have an impedance connected in series with a voltage source, okay, likewise it can be represented by uh, a current source connected in parallel with an impedance, okay, A, B. A, B. Okay, so this is Z Thevenin, Z Thevenin, okay, and this is the Thevenin equivalent in phasor domain, and this is the Norton equivalent in phasor domain, okay, where Z Thevenin is the impedance that you uh, compute or measure at the port terminals, okay, when you kill all the independent sources inside N. And this circuit, uh, this voltage is the open circuit voltage, okay, that is what you measure here when nothing is connected here, the voltage AB. And this current here is the current that you measure when you short the terminals A and B, okay, the direction of the current is from A to B, so that's what we calling the short circuit current, okay, and alternatively you can figure out the thevenin impedance by simply taking the ratio of open circuit voltage to short circuit current, okay, so Z thevenin equals V open circuit divided by I short circuit, okay, so let's apply this uh, uh, property to a circuit in phasor domain. Okay, here is our example. Now, consider the following circuit, which is directly given in phasor domain. So we don't have to transform it to phasor domain from time domain. Here we have 4 ohms, 1 ohm minus J, 3 ohms, 3 ohms, J, 3 ohms. Yeah, the voltage, and this is the current inside our one port. Okay, A, B. Suppose that we want to solve certain design problem associated to some other circuit which can be represented by ZL. L may stand for load. Okay, And to ease the computations, what we do is, uh, since as far as ZL is concerned, all that this one port cares about is the current voltage characteristics at the port terminals, this part of the circuit can be replaced by 
either a feminine equivalent one port or a northern equivalent one port. Okay. So in this example, we're going to figure that out. So given that I S the current is square root of two with phase minus four to five degrees amps and the voltage of the voltage source is eight is magnitude with zero phase okay volts we're asked to find the thermodynamic coolant circuit circuit seen by the uh, impedance ZL seen by the load ZL okay so what we will do is we're gonna first figure out the open circuit voltage by taking this out and then we're gonna short the terminals A and B and figure out the short circuit current and then once we have those two numbers their ratio will give us Z feminine and then we have the open circuit and Z feminine this connection will be the feminine equivalent circuit for this uh, much complicated topology okay. so we begin by obtaining the open circuit voltage First, let's find the open circuit voltage VOC. So, for simplicity, we can combine these two components and represent them by a single impedance because they're connected in series. So, that makes 1 minus J3 ohms. Then, here we have 4 ohm. Here we have our IS. Here we have. We can do the same thing and combine this resistor and inductor and represent it by a single single impedance, which simply has uh, three plus J three ohms impedance. Okay, three plus J three ohms for this guy, and here we have the voltage source plus minus Vs and here we have Is and what we now try to figure out is the voltage that appears across these terminals okay A and B <coughs> okay so let's well we can do any method we can apply any method that we want that's applicable for an LTR circuit so let's uh, do it using mesh analysis. We have two meshes. Let's call this mesh current I1 and let's call this mesh current I2. Once we find uh, these mesh currents, hold for I1 and I2, this voltage we open circuit would simply be this voltage plus minus, which is four times I1 and this voltage Vs. Vs, we already know it's eight volts. So let's write down the equation at the uh, super mesh. Okay, since there is a current source between those two meshes, we have to write the uh, mesh equation on the super mesh, or you can call it the outer mesh. Okay, so what we have here is so let's start from this point 1 minus J3 okay, times. I1 plus this voltage, okay, for I1. Then we have plus Vs, which is 8. And finally, we have this current, which is the impedance 3 plus J3 times I2. Plus 3 plus J3 times I2. And by KVL, that must equal 0. Now, Vs is given 
it equals minus uh, it equals eight volts. Therefore, we can reorganize that equation and obtain five minus J three I one plus three plus J three I two equals minus Vs, which is minus eight. Okay, so this is our equation one. So. The other equation will be coming from the constraint equation, namely I2 minus I1 should equal IS. And IS is given here. Okay, it's in rectangular form. 1 minus J amps. Okay, so let's write that down also. The constraint equation reads I2 minus I1 equals IS. Okay, so IS is in the same direction with I2 and opposite to I1. Therefore, the difference must equal IS. Then, I2 okay. then I2 equals okay, I1 plus IS. And IS expressed in rectangular uh, coordinates reads 1 minus j, so we have 1 minus j. Okay, let this be our equation 2. Now, what we can do is we can plug, substitute this i2 with this expression i1 plus 1 minus j, and then equation 1 becomes only in terms of i1, and then we can solve i1 easily. And once we have i1, this voltage is simply 4 times i1 plus Vs, okay, plus 8. So let's do that. Combine <coughs> equations 1 and 2 and write 5 minus J3 I1 plus 3 plus J3 times I2 and I2 is I1 plus 1 minus J thanks to equation 2, thanks to our constraint equation. And the right hand side equals minus 8. Okay, now this equation is only in terms of I1, and we have 8 I1 equals minus 8 minus 3 plus J3 1 minus J. Okay, so this produces 6, and we have minus 8 minus 6 that reads minus 14 from which we write I1 equals minus 14 divided by 8 minus 7 over 4 amps okay and finally let me squeeze the open circuit voltage here we open circuit voltage equals 4 times this current which is I1 plus the voltage of the voltage source which is 8 we have 4I1 plus Vs, and that equals 4 times minus 7 over 4 plus 8, and that gives us 1 volt. Okay, so that's our open circuit voltage, or the Thevenin in voltage. Okay, now let's do the dual operation, namely, let's find the short circuit current. Second step is to compute the short circuit current. Let's redraw the one port, this time the port terminals shorted. Okay, plus minus eight volts. Here we have one minus J and okay these impedances as before 1 minus j3 ohm and 3 plus j3 ohm 3 plus j3 
three ohms. And here we have the four ohm resistor. Okay. What we do is we connect the port terminals and we're now interested in figuring out this current, short circuit current. Okay. Now, uh, here we use mesh analysis and here uh, just let's remember that we can also use node analysis and for this configuration it seems uh, better to use the node analysis or easier let's say so let's choose a node this is our uh, ground node and let me call this node voltage by E okay now that we don't have to label this node voltage because it's directly 8 it's known and also we don't have to label this node voltage because it's because of this short circuit connection this node is also ground therefore we have just a single unknown which is the node voltage E okay so let's write down the uh, node equation at the only node E over okay 3 plus J3 plus J3 okay so this current plus that current plus that current equals 0 plus 1 minus J which is the current of the independent source and finally we have this current which is since this node is ground this current simply is E divided by the impedance 1 minus J3 1 minus J3 and by KCL which holds in phase or domain equals 0 okay let's reorganize it and we can write 1 over 3 plus J3 plus 1 1 minus J3 E equals minus 1 plus J the right hand side from which E can be computed to equal minus 3 over 2 plus J 9 over 2 volts in rectangular form so that's our node voltage E now once node voltage E is known we can add these two currents and by KCL that current must equal the short circuit current this current simply is E divided by the impedance because that node is ground node how about this current IR if you write KVL in this mesh okay on the right hand side you see that minus 8 plus 4 IR plus 0 equals 0 therefore IR must be 2 amps in other words uh, another way to see it is that here we have uh, this terminal is the positive terminal of this voltage source and due to this short circuit connection this terminal of 4 ohm resistor is connected to the negative terminal of the voltage source therefore the voltage drop across the 4 ohm resistor must be 8 volts and that automatically gives us IR once we have IR we know this current which is E divided by 1 minus J3 the sum is the short circuit current and we will be done okay so IR equals 8 over 4 that's 2 amps so we can write I short circuit equals E so this current which is E divided by 1 minus J3 plus the current over the 4 ohm resistor IR okay so that equals minus 3 over 2 1 minus J3 so we wrote E in this form okay divided by 1 minus J3 and then those two 1 minus J3s will cancel and we will be left with minus 3 over 2 to that we add IR which is 2 okay so minus 1.5 plus 2 that gives us 0 0.5 amps 1 over 2 amps and that's our short circuit current once we have the open circuit voltage and short circuit current that means we have the uh, feminine impedance because their ratio gives us 1 over 1 half which is 2 gives us the feminine impedance okay so let's put that down also hence 
Z7'in equals V open circuit divided by I short circuit. Okay, which is one over one half and the result is two. The unit is volt over amps, namely ohms. Okay. Now alternatively we could have figure out the seven in uh, seven impedance by simply killing all the independent sources inside and computing the input impedance. Let's do that because it's quite easy for this problem. Okay. And double check that we have the right seven in impedance value. We can compute the seven in impedance C seven in by killing the independent sources inside our one port. Okay. Now we have two sources: this current source and this voltage source. Killing this means replacing it with open circuit. Killing that means replacing it with short circuit. Once those modifications are performed, the one port becomes extremely simple. Okay. okay. This is 4 ohms, 1 minus J, 3 ohms, 3 plus J, 3 ohms. Okay. And we are interested in this input impedance, which is uh, Z7 seven in impedance. Okay. Now, since the current source is rem removed, these two impedances become serious. In series, therefore, 1 minus J3 and 3 plus J3. This here is, what, 4 ohms. And here we have 4 ohms. That's parallel to that 4 ohms. So 4, 4 parallel, that produces 2 ohms. Okay, so that's equal to this 2 ohm impedance okay so finally we can write the answer the load in the first circuit ZL sees the circuit that is connected to as either this okay a B here we have 7 in voltage or the open circuit voltage and here we have the 7 in impedance which is 2 ohms alternatively it can also be represented by the Norton circuit where we have again the same 7 in impedance 2 ohms A B and this is 1 over 2, 0 degrees amps. That's our Norton current or the short circuit current. Okay, now let's move on to another example. Okay, which is short but it's a very important example because we will be using it many times later on. our next example. So suppose that in some circuit 
in sinusoidal steady state and LTI circuit. Part of the circuit is this one port where we have an ideal transformer. Okay. With turns ratio n to 1. And let's call this the first coil, the, uh, the one on the right, second coil, and the second coil's terminals are terminated by another one port, okay, which does not contain any independent sources, therefore that one port can be represented by an impedance. And suppose that the impedance of that one port is ZL. ZL. Okay, the load impedance, if you will. And then we are asked for the input impedance seen from, for this case, the terminals of the first coil. Okay. So, so let's compute that. For that, we, we need to do some labeling. Let's call this voltage V1. So that's the phase of the voltage of the first coil. Let's call this voltage V2. And since the uh, terminal equations of an idle transformer carry uh, intact to the phasor domain, what we have is V1 over N equals V2. Okay, V2 over 1. Let's also label the currents. This is our I1 and this current is our I2. The same holds for the current equation, simply we have n times i1 plus i2 must equal zero. So those are the terminal equations in phase domain, which are exactly the same equations uh, as in time domain. Okay, so what's z in? Whenever this guy is connected, the input impedance is, by definition, the ratio of this voltage v1 to that current i1. Okay, so z in equals, by definition, Okay, the ratio of V1 to I1. Okay, now let's express V1 in terms of V2 and I1 in terms of I2 using the terminal equations of the ideal transformer. What's V1? V1 is, okay, V1 over N equals V2, therefore V1 equals N times V2. N times V2. How about I1? And I1 equals, excuse me, and I1 plus I2 equals zero. Therefore, I1 equals minus I2 over N. Okay, minus I2 over N. And now, let's also use the constraint imposed on this pair of voltage current V2 I2 by the load impedance ZL. Note that this voltage V2 equals the impedance times the current in that direction and current in that direction is by KCL minus I2. Therefore instead of V2 we can write ZL times IL or ZL times minus I2. Okay minus ZL times I2 minus I2 over N and then we have an I2 in numerator and I2 in denominator those two I2s will cancel, and what remains is N square times the load impedance. So that's the input impedance seen from the terminals of the first coil. Okay. Z in, therefore, equals N square ZL. Okay, now let's, in our next example, Again, we have uh, some idle transformer. Here's our next example where we once again are asked to find the input uh, impedance for a one port. This time the one port is significantly uh, more complicated than this 
topology. But that just means writing more equations. So we have the following. So the circuit is directly given in phasor domain. So we have J one half ohms for this inductor, one over four ohms, one over J two ohms for the capacitor, and uh, and that's it. Okay. Now this one part can be represented by at least from the. Uh, current voltage characteristics point of view at the port terminals by a single impedance and we ask for that impedance okay called input impedance okay now since we cannot simply obtain this by doing series and parallel additions things like that what we do is we uh, connect a test source okay let, let it be a current source of one amps and then with this test source what we will do is we will try to figure out the voltage that this test source generates at the port terminals then the ratio of that voltage to the current which is simply one will yield will give us the input impedance okay in ohms so the problem therefore becomes solving the circuit for this voltage for that let's apply node analysis let this be our ground node and then let me label this node as E1 this node voltage as E2 and here we have another node let's call that node voltage E3 okay so we have three formulation variables moreover we'll have some currents too because because of the uh, the transform okay so let, let's write down the equations and then once the equations are written down, in principle at least, we can figure out E1. And once we have E1, this input impedance simply equals E1 divided by 1. Okay. So, Let's begin from node 1, okay? So here we have node 1, and uh, attached to node 1, we have four wires, so that means we're going to add four currents, and sum that to zero. So minus 1, this current, which is uh, due to the current source, plus E1 over 1 half, which is this current, Okay, plus E1 minus E2 over the impedance of the capacitor. Okay, 1 over J2. And finally, we have this current here. At this stage, we cannot express that current in terms of our formulation variables E1, E2, E3. So, therefore, let's consider it one of our formulation variables. And same goes for the current of the second coil. So let's write plus I1 equals zero. So that's our first KCL equation at node one. Reorganized, it can be written in the following form. Two plus J2 E1 minus J2 E2 plus I1 equals one. This is our equation one. Okay, we need four more equations because we have three node voltages and two transformer currents 
four, five unknowns. Node two, we have this current, that current plus that current equals zero. This is I two plus E two over the resistance one over four. And finally, we have that current, which is E2 minus E1 divided by the impedance of the capacitor, which is 1 over J2. 1 over J2 by KCL, that equals 0. We organize, it produces the following equation, J2 E1 plus 4 minus J2 E2 plus I2 equals 0. Okay, second equation. So far, so good. And node 3. Here, here. So what we have is this current, which is E3 over J1 half. And then we have this current and that current. This is minus I1 and that current is minus I2. Minus I1 minus I2 by KCL should produce zero. Okay. So that's our equation number three. Okay, so that's all the equations, KCL equations, that can be written on the, uh, on the nodes. So we need two more equations. Note that we haven't yet used the terminal equations for the ideal transformer. It has two terminal equations, therefore those equations will be the missing equations. So let's also write them down. We have the voltage constraint. imposed by the ideal transformer, which says the voltage of the first coil divided by 4 equals voltage of the second coil. The voltage of, voltage of the first coil is E1 minus E3. So we have E1 minus E3 over N1 equals E2 minus over N2. Okay which can be put in the following form E1 minus 4E2 plus 3E3 three e three equals 0 equation 4 so we need one last equation and that's the current constraint which says 4I1 plus I2 equals 0 4 I1 plus I2 equals 0. Equation 5. Okay. Now, suppose that we actually want to solve this example for some practical problem. So what we do in this such case, we can always do it by hand, but when you have many, many variables, it's good to take help from software. And whenever you want to use a software, it's best to express, to formulate your problem in terms of matrices, okay? Because uh, softwares love matrices, for instance, MATLAB. So for that reason, let's put all the equations that we have obtained into the following matrix form, okay? We have, therefore, this 5 by 5 matrix because we have five unknowns times the formulation variables equals the right hand side. Here we have E1, E2, E3, I1 and I2. This is our 5 by 5 matrix and this is the right hand side. So let's figure out the entries of the matrix. For the first row we'll look at the first equation which is over there. 2 plus J2 E1 minus J2 E2 plus 0 E3 plus 1 I1 plus 0 I2 equals the right hand side which is 1. For the second row we look at the second equation minus J2 E1 4 plus J2 E2 plus 0 E3 plus 0 I1 and plus 1 I2 and that equals the right hand side which is 0. Third row, third equation, we have 
this can be written as minus j2. So we have for okay, we have 0 and 0 for e1 and e2. For e3, we have minus j2, and then we have minus 1 and minus 1 for i1 and i2, and right hand side is 0. Okay. The fourth equation gives us the fourth row. 1 for e1, minus 4 for e2, 3 for e3, we have 0, 0, 0. So that was our voltage constraint. And finally, the current constraint produces 0, 0, 0, 4, 1, 0. Okay, and this is our equation 6, which is, which contains all the first five equations. Okay, and then for instance, using MATLAB, note that here, this is abbreviation for Matrix Laboratory. Okay, therefore, MATLAB and almost all software like uh, matrices. So, using MATLAB and equation 6, we can compute our unknown vectors by simply multiplying both sides by the inverse of this 5 by 5 matrix. And that produces something not that pretty but we don't care because we do it using the computer 39 over 180 volts so that's our e1 the first node voltage which also is the voltage that appears across the terminals of our uh, driving input okay the one amp current source therefore the input impedance equals that over 1, so volt over amps, so it's the same thing, but the unit is ohms this time, okay? So 47 over 180 minus J39 over 180 ohms, so that's the input impedance for the one port given. Okay. Now, in our final example in this lecture, Let's uh, try to observe certain properties that links the phasor domain circuit or phasor domain analysis and the state equation. This is the circuit that we will study. Plus minus Vs two I two three ohms. Okay, so it's a second order circuit. We have two inductors, okay, with inductances 1500 and 300. Furthermore, those, those two inductors happen to be coupled, and mutual inductance is given to be 6 Henry's. Okay, so here we have 6 Henry of mutual inductance. The, uh, Currents are given as I1 and I2. Okay, now for this circuit, we are asked to perform certain things. Obtain the state equation for the state choice x, I1, and I2. Namely, our state vector contains the inductor currents I1 and I2. We show that this circuit is stable so that we can talk about a sinusoidal 
steady state when the circuit is driven by a sinusoidal source that's B and C for input Vs of T equals 30 cosine omega T omega being one radians per second and with some phase phi volts find the steady state solution which exists because the circuit is stable steady state solution x s s t and finally part d find the initial condition namely find the initial inductor currents so that x of t that is the solution the complete solution of the circuit equals the steady state solution okay so we know that x of t converges to x s s t because the circuit is stable but now we ask for something peculiar we ask that once you start the circuit starting from the initial condition that's uh, initial time let's take it to equal t equals zero it immediately starts with the, uh, the solution that it is supposed to converge to okay so that's the last part okay so we uh, did many state equation examples in the past therefore I will just write down the answer for part A but it would be a nice exercise for those of you who have time to uh, obtain the state equation And once we have the state equation, that means you have the A matrix. And once we have the A matrix, that means you have the eigenvalues. And eigenvalues are the natural frequencies of the circuit. If the eigenvalues are such that all the real parts are strictly negative, so that means the circuit is stable. So that means we will have a meaningful steady state for that circuit when the input is a sinusoidal uh, waveform. Okay, here is the solution. Part A is an exercise, the derivation, and the answer turns out to be the following. X dot equals AX plus B input. Input is the voltage of the voltage source. This is our A matrix, and this is our B matrix. A matrix equals minus 5, minus 4, 2, 1. And the B matrix is 1 and minus 1 over 3. Okay. And B is also exercise. Basically, you will figure out the eigenvalues of the A matrix. Okay. And show that uh, both of them are with negative real parts okay so that's and that will show that the circuit is stable and now let's concentrate on the part of this example which is relevant to the phasor domain analysis okay for the input being that sinusoidal waveform and given that the circuit is, and we know that the circuit is stable so we expect a steady state solution and that steady state solution should satisfy the state equation okay so in steady state x of t will be what so x of t is the currents i1 of t and i2 of t and you know that in steady state all the currents and voltages throughout the circuit will be sinusoidal signals they will be oscillating with one radians uh, one radian per second and de depending on the component, amplitude and phase will change, but they will all have the same frequency of oscillations. So that means x of t in steady state will have the following form. Some amplitude, let's call R1, cosine omega t, omega is 1 for our example, okay, because it's determined by 
the frequency of the input. Omega t plus some phase, let's call it phi 1. And the same form holds also for the second inductor current, phi 2. Okay. So that's the steady state solution, where for our case, omega equals 1 radians per second. Now let's define the phasers. For R each state variable. Namely, let's obtain this complex number or vector on complex plane by taking the magnitude or, and the phase of the first signal, namely x1 is R1 e to the j phi1. And do the same thing for the second state variable or the second inductor current. x2 is R2 e to the j phi 2. Okay. And let's also write the phase of the input, which is the magnitude is given to be 30 and the phase is given to be psi. E to the j psi. And that's the phase representation of the input. The frequency of oscillations is 1 radians per second. And now, construct, using these two complex numbers, the phase of the vector, okay? Namely, we have x1 and x2. All the letters are capital. Then x of t, in terms of the phasers we just introduced, can be written as the following. x of t equals the real part of this vector x multiplied by e to the j omega t. Okay, omega is 1 radian per second. So that's the relation between time domain signal and its phaser, which we defined earlier for scalar signals, but it clearly uh, works for more generalized uh, the case. Okay, and this x of t should satisfy the state equation. The state equation. Namely, we must have x that equals ax plus bvs. Okay, now let's plug this uh, x of t into the state equation and see what we will get. Okay, d over dt x of t. So that's x dot, but instead of writing x of t, we write it using its phasor representation. Okay, real part of x, this is a vector, e to the j omega t. And the right hand side equals a times real part of x e to the j omega t plus b times let's do the same thing to vs of t and write b times real part of phase of vs times e to the j omega t okay. so that's the state equation written in terms of phasers and that will give us what Now, this real operator and this derivative operator, they can commute. That means we can carry this differentiation inside the parentheses. This is constant. This is the only thing that uh, varies with respect to time. And its derivative simply is j omega times e to the j omega t. Hence, this produces the real part of j omega x e to the j omega t equals, we can combine these two things into a single real, or co collect them under a single real operator. Because A and B are real matrices, they can carry, they can go inside the parentheses. And when you do that, you have A x plus B B s e to the j omega t. Okay. 
this produces what? We know that if this holds for all times, and it certainly does because it satisfies the state equation, so that means this thing here and this thing here must equal to one another. Okay. So let's write that down. J omega x must equal a x plus b v s. Okay. So from the differential equation, now we have obtained an algebraic equation. No more differentiation. And then that produces what? X equals Okay, carry this guy to the other side. What we have is j omega x minus ax equals bvs. And that difference can be written as j omega i, i being the identity matrix, times a, uh, excuse me, minus a times x equals bvs. Hence, x can be written as j omega i minus a, that matrix is inverse, times bvs. j omega identity minus a inverse bvs. And that equals, now, plug in omega equals 1 for our case. We know B, okay, and we know Vs. Vs is 30 times e to the j phi. And if you do that, what you obtain is the following 7 plus j and minus 1 minus j3. And then we have the phase coming from, the extra phase coming from the input. So that's our x. So the first entry will be x1. The phasor of the first inductor current, the second entry will be x2, the phasor of the second inductor current. And once we know the phasors plus the operation frequency, we can easily write down the time domain sequence. So let's do that. Hence, the steady state uh, function uh, that's that the state converges to equals the following vector. Okay, so what we have is okay for the first okay for the first entry for x one the magnitude is the magnitude of this number seven plus j seven square plus one square that makes. 50, then we take the square root. Therefore, we're talking about a sinusoidal signal with amplitude 5 times square root of 2. And cosine, the omega is t. Uh, omega is 1, so we have just a t plus the phase of the input plus the phase of this uh, complex number, which is arctangent 1 over 7. Arctangent 1 over 7. For the second entry, let's do the same thing. The magnitude is 1 square plus 3 square, 10 square. So that square root, excuse me. So square root of 10. Then we have cosine t plus phi, uh, excuse me, psi. That's the phase of the input. Okay, and plus the phase of minus 1, minus j3. What's the phase of minus 1, minus j3? This is... Uh, the complex plane. Okay. This is minus 1, this is minus j3. This is imaginary part. So here we have this angle is arctangent 3 over 1, so arctangent 3. And the phases, since we're measuring the phase from starting from the positive real axis in the counterclockwise direction, the overall phase is this arctangent 3 plus 180 degrees. Okay, so we have that 4 plus pi and plus arctangent. Okay, so that's our steady state state. And that completes part C. And finally, we were asked in part D the following how we should choose 
the initial conditions so that x of d the complete solution starts directly from where it should converge to at this point we know that no matter where you start your circuit that is no matter how you choose the initial inductor currents x of d because the circuit is stable will converge as time goes to infinity to xs a steady state solution that we just found and the, the answer to d therefore is since this solution that we have found satisfies the uh, differential equation constraint if it also satisfies the initial condition constraint then it must be the solution not just the solution that the actual solution converges to but the solution itself and for that all we have to realize is that we have to choose the initial inductor currents to equal the value uh, that XSS produces for the time t equals zero if this is satisfied, it means that this solution satisfies not only the state equation but also the initial condition constraint. Therefore, this is not just the steady state solution but the overall solution also.